Yes, okay, right? Why? Why are you excited for the week? Because we're going to make it a better life. That's the whole point. Isn't the whole purpose of life to be better and better? Do you want a better life? Maybe these people here, I don't know. Maybe they've already got it too good. Okay, good. Louder. They got to hear you in Italy and in Norway. Where do I have South Africa? You want a better life? Yes. yes. The only issue is how are we going to do that? How do we make our lives better? So, ah, if you're here, you're learning as we're about to affirm. It's about consciousness. It's about the way we think and understand life works. If we don't raise our understanding of life, then what's going to happen to the way we act? The way we act is going to stay the same. We cannot stay the same and expect our life to get better. We have to be better people. And as we're going to discuss today, it's only up to us. So the beauty of Kabbalah, and I was just sharing it, I do a few minutes online before we get here in the room. The beauty of Kabbalah is it's not about, no matter what your opponent in your head tells you, it's not about religion, it's not about dogma, it's not about ritual, it's not about philosophy, it's not about theology. In fact, the paradox is, it's only that opponent that's in our head who is there to train us to behave as we were created to behave, right? So therefore, it's got to oppose us. It's that opponent who has created all the divisiveness. Religion, culture, language, nationality, colors, races, beliefs, etc. So the beauty for me, after 30, almost 32 years in the center, is the power of spiritual technology. That's why if you look at our, our information, it's all about spiritual technology or technology for the soul. So it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist, a Christian, a Hindu, a Jew, or atheist, whatever else there is out there, everybody has a soul. The other part is we have to overcome the idea that those people out there that we don't like don't have a soul. Yeah, see, we can all relate at least one time in our life, right? You don't know that person, Chaim. That person doesn't have a soul. Why? Why would we say that? Because they didn't give us our way. They didn't act how we want them to act towards us. So therefore, they can't have a soul. But, okay, let's go there for a minute. What in the physical universe does not have a soul? Let's think about it. A soul means what? Really, if we really boil it down, what does a soul mean? The power of the creator. The power of the creator. That's what a soul is. So the chairs you're sitting on, does it have a soul? Does it have energy of the creator? Yes or yes? Absolutely. So it has a soul. So if the chair has an aspect of soul, not necessarily a high consciousness like we human beings, but it has an aspect of the soul. So if that does, then even that person you don't like, the person you didn't get along with, the person who did those things to you that whatever you're still holding on to, they also have a soul. What we're learning here is how to activate that soul. You go home at night and the light, the house is dark. Ever happened to you? Yeah, right? You walk in the living room, it's dark. So are there no lights in your house? They're there, right? Are there lights in the living room? Yes. Do you have nice lamps or whatever it is? Yes. So then why is it dark in the house? You didn't turn on the light. Not because there is no light. So if I walked into your house and I'd never been there and it's dark in the living room, dark in the house, couldn't I say from my perspective, wow, what happened to you? You're not in the 21st century? No light bulbs in the house? No light fixtures in the house? Couldn't I say that? I could because it's dark. So obviously you don't have light, but we know better. There's a light and a, a fixture and a bulb, but it has to be turned on. Once it's turned on now, what happens to the darkness? Goes away. So whether it's you and I when we look in the mirror or it's the people we see around us or people we've had in our life who have acted in ways that didn't make us feel good, didn't help us and support us to be whatever, successful in whatever it is, or to move forward in our life, etc., doesn't mean they don't have the light inside them. Doesn't mean they don't have a soul. It means they haven't been activating it. Our job is not only to activate ours, but to help everybody else activate theirs. 
Because as we do that, then we're better people, they're better people, and what happens to our life? Gets better. Because as we raise our consciousness to see that bigger picture, then it's easier for us to act in that bigger picture. And once we do that, then our life has to be better. Has to be because the universe is cause and effect based on us, as we'll talk today. So, oh, yes, I forgot to ask. How many of you are brand new to Spiritual Sunday? Ooh, raise your hands high. Thank you for joining us. All right. And thank you for joining, especially these weeks, right? When people are going off on their vacations or whatever it is. So, what we're going to do is we're going to say our affirmation. And the beauty of the affirmation, even though it's the same thing we say every week, does it have to do the same things for us? Exactly. Changes by the power we put in it. Changes by the effort in our consciousness. So if it's the same in our mind, then that's what it will do. If it's today different than it was last week, then it will do different things for us. So let's say it together. Those of you online, you can join us. I know it's projected there. We say it together. Consciousness is everything. I raise my consciousness today to see the miracles and wonders of life. I commit myself to behave with greater love, compassion, and kindness towards all human beings. And so while we're greeting each other here in the Boca Center, I would like you who are online to write a greeting to each other, maybe even say where you are, or let's say one good attribute about yourself that you're going to accentuate this week. Okay, so let's get started. The main message this morning. So two weeks ago, we entered into the month of Capricorn. And as we spoke a little about that, and in two weeks, we're going to enter into the month of Aquarius. All right, so we're like exactly right in the middle. So we mentioned Capricorn is our opportunity. It's the cosmic energy that will support us to overcome our illusions, our limitations, right? All of the things that hold us back from our perfection, from all the blessings the Creator gave us. So I wanted to add to that today, and those of you who uh, follow on Facebook, I mentioned it there in that first sentence. God does not create chaos. I don't care what the opponent told you. We're going to be very open Kabbalistically, and many of you who have taken the classes, you'll understand it. Those of you who are new, please at least be open-minded to it. If it pushes your buttons, that's a good thing, actually, if you will work with it. Ask questions afterwards, talk to people, read a little bit to find out how it works. But it's essential that we now start putting in our minds, God, the Creator, does not, cannot, not only create chaos, cannot in any way, shape, or form, cannot create chaos individually or collectively, but here's really the thing that maybe for some of you is probably the most difficult to keep in mind because the way we've been trained, God cannot see chaos. So that means no matter what we've learned as we grew up in whatever religion, and all say basically the same, we have to pray to God to stop the chaos, make our lives better, etc., etc. Well, let's be objective, in thousands of years, with all the religions, etc., praying and meditating and doing, has chaos disappeared? No. So we have to start taking a new perspective on it. And that's the beauty of what the Kabbalah Center is teaching us. Because why can't God see or create chaos? If we really think about it, Let's take our world, the benches you're sitting on. They're made of wood, yes? So how were they made? Were they made out of plastic? Were they made out of metal? The material of the bench is wood. So it had to be made from a tree, right? So you take a tree, you reshape it, and now it becomes a wooden bench. You can only make what you come from. So if we believe the Creator, the Light Force, God, is perfect, then God can only create perfection and can only see perfection. God can only create and only see perfection. So now we go to the Bible and we say, wait a second, doesn't the Bible tell us right in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth? Right? First, word, first verse out of Genesis. 
in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But then if you keep reading, and maybe that's sometimes our problem, we don't connect the first sentence with a few chapters down the line where it says, you and I, every human being, was created in what? The image and likeness of God. Now, most of us as we grow up, we hear some of these things, etc. And I'm sure in many ways you are like me. You go, you go, you go, they tell you things, and when you start to ask questions, unfortunately what? They don't always have answers. Sometimes it'll come down to, well, that's what God wants from us, and that's what's written, and that's what we have to do. But how many of you have children? How many of you remember when your children were, let's say, four or five or six, and they could speak, and you tell them something, and what's the first thing they ask? Why? Now, of course, sadly, because many times we act like our parents, what we grew up with, so when our kids ask us, why mom, why dad, what do we say? Because I'm the mom, I'm the dad, because that's what we heard, right? But do we or do we not really have a reason? Everything we ask of our kids, we have a reason. Maybe selfish, maybe caught up in the moment, maybe sharing, doesn't matter, but there is a reason behind it. So the most natural thing for human beings is to ask why. But when it comes now to the Bible, we don't ask because we get so inundated by things and if it starts to not make sense, then we just say, okay, but that's what religion is. The mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of the Creator. No, Kabbalah is taking out the mysteries. You ever read a mystery novel? You ever read it twice? The second time, if you read it, did you forget who did it? You're reading the whole book. You already know who did it. But sometimes even reading it the second time, it's not about who did it. It's about the journey along the way. Different details that you didn't remember hearing the first time or suddenly now you see how it all fits together. Okay, I guess I just, did you ever see the movie The Sixth Sense? Yeah. You have to see it twice. <laughs> because you go along the first time and you're watching, 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 and then you find out he's dead. Now you've got to go back and watch the movie again and say, why didn't I see that? <laughs> Even though you know what's at the end, but you're seeing it differently, yes or yes. Yeah. Exactly. So in life, it's the same thing. Sometimes things are happening to us again and again and again because we didn't see it the right way the first time, or the highest way. So every time gives us an opportunity to raise our consciousness, see it in a new way. So if you put those two verses of the Bible together, especially with the teaching called the Zohar that unlocks the code of the Bible. So when it says that you and I, human beings, created in the image and likeness of God, what does it mean? We have the power of creation. God created us with its power of creation. We create the heaven and earth. Yes, we, collective humanity, created the stars and the planets, created the physical universe, created all the laws of science. Everything that goes on in this universe is our creation using the power of God that was given to us, but it's our creation. And because we have a human side, we've been given free will in this universe, then we are able to create chaos. Because we have that perspective. We have the part of us. Anyone here has a little anger, jealousy, greed, ego, fear, insecurity? Four people. The rest of the people here must have the issue of not always telling, acknowledging the truth. <laughs> right? We all have something. So if we have a little bit of impatience, then we are capable to see impatience or chaos disarray in the world. Because we have it, we can see it. The Creator doesn't have impatience, cannot see impatience. The Creator doesn't have anger, does not see anger. The Creator doesn't have hatred and violence, cannot see hatred and violence. But we, because we have facets of that, we are able to recognize those things in the world, in our lives and in the world in general. But 
since we are in the image and likeness of the Creator, and now we're learning to understand that we are creating our heavens and our earth, then when we see chaos, what power do we also have? The ability to remove the chaos. But if we're waiting for somebody else to remove our chaos, or we're waiting for the Creator to remove our chaos, we'll be waiting forever. Because it's not up to them. We create our chaos, they create their chaos, and then collectively we can take away all the chaos. So we have to keep in mind the heaven and the earth that you and I see today, the way our life is, we have created it. Now, before those of you who are newer or those of you watching online who are new, I am not saying in any way, shape, or form that you made that other person do that nasty thing to you. Please remember, that's not what we're saying. You didn't tell that other person, yes, yeah, come hit me or come steal from me. Or no, you didn't say that. You didn't create that. But you created whatever came from that. So we all make choices that put us in situations that allow us the capability to do what we came here to do. Be better divine beings. Be better divine beings. Take away the chaos. Those of you who've been with us for a while, you know my favorite example. Okay, I won't test you. The Rubik's Cube. Everyone knows what a Rubik's Cube is? You buy it off the shelf, it's perfect. Each side, white, blue, yellow, whatever the colors are, it's perfect. Now you do like this, right? You mix it up. Now does it look like it's all white, all yellow, all red, all green? No, now it looks like chaos. Now it looks like chaos. Who turned perfection to chaos? We did. So then if we learn the system, we can turn chaos back to perfection. If you're like me, I don't know the system. So for me, it will remain chaos forever. Or until I give it to my kids. <laughs> they can turn it back into order because they know how. They know the system. So the power of the Kabbalah Center for almost 100 years now, from the lineage of great Kabbalists back to the origin of the Zohar itself, is to give every human being on earth the wisdom the technology, the understanding of how to turn chaos back into order, like the Rubik's Cube, because the Creator only created perfection and then gave it to us. We have the ability to mix it up or put it back. So let's accept the responsibility for our life moving forward, for whether we create heaven or hell, order or chaos. It's in our hands. The power of what the center is, is to give us support from other people to put our lives into order. Nobody in this room, nobody watching, nobody, however close they are to you, how much they love you, can take your chaos away. It's not like the Rubik's Cube in that way. You can't give your chaos to somebody else to fix. They can encourage you, they can teach you the ways and means, like we do here in the center, but in the end of the story, it's up to you. You create it. You leave it or you create it. So we've got to realize whether we're aware of it or not, what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis? We're creating our lives. We are creating it. You wake up in the morning, you have the same thoughts, the same consciousness as yesterday. Guess what kind of world you create? The same. So even if you're mostly happy, that little piece that's not so happy will stay the same. Because we know the universe is cause and effect, is it not? So then it's all in our hands. As we will raise, like we affirm, greater actions of love, compassion, and kindness towards everybody, then the universe has to bring back to us love, kindness, compassion on a higher level. The more humble we are, the more humility comes back to us. Less ego dealing with other people etc., right down the line. It's all in our hands. So we've got to start realizing every thought we have is creating. Every action we do is creating because we are those co-creators. We've been given the power of creation. So this world is up to us. 
The upper world is the pattern of perfection. That's what we're constantly drawing on. But we've got to realize, wherever we put our thoughts, you know the example of that half full and half empty cup? So before Kabbalah, what do we say? Well, the people who see the half empty, what do we call them? Pessimists, Pessimists right? So then when they're looking at the world, what perspective do they have on the world? Pessimistic, right? Oh, look at the trouble, look at the chaos. Yes, that's just the way it's going to go. The world's just going to hell in a handbasket. Yes or yes? Because they've already started with a pessimistic idea. So they will see everything pessimistically. Now you have the other people, they see the half full. So what do we call them? Optimists. So then when they look around the world, say, yes, it looks bad over there, but you know what? It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Our question as Kabbalists is, it's <laughs> lifeline, right? Our question is Kabbalists, what is going to make the world better? We can be optimistic all day, but if we don't do something, I can look at that Rubik's Cube and I can be optimistic. I even know that there's a solution to it. But if I sit there and just look, I say, yes, I know there's a solution. I know it can be done. I know it can be done. And I hold it for an hour. Is it going to change? Is it now going to be less chaotic? No, not at all, because I didn't do anything. So it's not about optimism or pessimism. It's about the actions we do. Because the actions we do are what will come back to us. It's interesting. We don't often, and another way just that you'll understand that the Bible is a code, needs to be unlocked, which is what Kabbalah is about. So there's a very interesting verse in Job. You all know Job? Biblical figure, right? Horrible life, as the Bible tells us. All the bad things that happen to him. So one of the verses, he says like this. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come to me. So we say, uh-oh, so if we hold fear in our mind, fearful things will come to us? Well, in a simple way, conceptually, absolutely. Whatever we put the most power in, whatever we keep in the forefront of our mind, the universe is our partner. The universe will take our lead. So we put chaos in the cosmos, the cosmos has to bring some form of chaos back. <clears throat> I twist like this the Rubik's Cube, what is the Rubik's Cube going to show me? Chaos. It's simple. But the thing we don't realize, because if you read just the story, what does it say? Oh, here's Job, and one day Job is sitting there, and now right, comes the sons of God and the sons of Satan and blah, 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 and they make his life miserable. But do you know who Job was? Hmm, most of us don't look into that until you come here. Job, and it's interesting, we're just now getting started. The story of the Exodus. Remember the Exodus? Right? The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt by the Pharaoh. Right? So if you read in the Bible, it starts to say, uh-oh, all these people, you know, Pharaoh brought Jacob down to, uh, into Egypt and gave them all the good stuff and this and this. And all of a sudden it says, and then the Pharaoh woke up one day and says, you know what? These people, these foreigners are getting to be too many people. They might overtake us. So what does Pharaoh do? Like a good leader... He takes his advisory board and he says, okay, what should we do with these people? Job was one of those advisors. Now it'll start to make more sense. What did Job advise the Pharaoh to do? Torture and torment them. Beat them into submission. Well, if that's what he put out in the cosmos, what has to come back to him? What you read in the book of Job. All the chaos that came to him that in the end of the story, what was the real purpose of all that chaos that came back to him? Opportunity, like knowing the way to put the Rubik's Cube back, which in the end he did. He finally came to believe in the Creator. Okay, I will be a good person. I will do better things. And he was restored, like you and I. As we learn Kabbalah and put it into practice, our life will be piece by piece back into order. Back into order. Every day better and better and better. Not because the day makes it better, because we've made it better. We have the power of creation. The thing is we don't 
acknowledge it, number one, and we don't believe how powerful we are. How many of you can multiply 365 by 248 now? Oh, somebody's got the answer, right? We can't do that, but we say, give me a calculator and I can get you the answer in a microsecond. Look how powerful the calculator is, or the computer. So my teachers, the Rav and Karen Berg, you know what they told me? Who built the calculator? Who built the computer? Human beings, no. The computer didn't build the computer. We built the computer. So if we built the computer, then our capacity has to be at least as good as that computer. But what happens? We blocked ourselves. We don't believe. We haven't opened ourselves up to the power that if we can create a computer, then we can be like a computer. And on top of that, what does the opponent do? There are people out there. Google them. I'm sure you'll find them. People who can do that. You can give them numbers like 10,638,000 times 9,342,000 and boom! Fast as a calculator, they can give you the answer. And the people I've heard say, I don't know how I do it. The number just shows up in my mind and I'm just reading the number. But you and I don't believe we can do that. They're the exception to the rule. Right? There was a show on for a while. I don't know if it's still on. Human beings like superhumans. Right? And all these different people with all these different capabilities that we would consider superhuman. But remember, we have, and maybe I'm a Libra, I see it easy. We have two natures. We have a human nature. We have a divine nature. If we give in to our human nature, yes, it's like me and the Rubik's Cube. My human nature doesn't know the system. For me, it'll always be chaos. But my divine nature has the answers for everything. Because that's the perfection the Creator implanted in us that we are here to make manifest. That's our job. So if one person can be a human calculator, we can all do it. We can all process, and we do. We don't even realize it. Ask any physical physiological researcher. The brain processes, even when we don't realize it, probably hundreds of thousands of times more information than the greatest computer on earth. But we're not conscious. So therefore, when these different things come, so oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. But meanwhile, we're already expressing more power than the greatest computer on earth. But like any computer, what do they call it? Geigo? Garbage in, garbage out. So we have the greatest supercomputer in our brain, but if we allow garbage in, the only thing going to be is garbage out. Just like a computer. The same thing. So let's start waking up and realizing, no, we are here to create our own lives, and we are constantly creating whether we realize it or not. What power are we using? Yes, that's important. We're using the power of the Creator. We're using the power of the light force. It's not our own power, but we're the ones who determine on or off, channeling the power of the light or not channeling the power of the light, seeing chaos or seeing order. My kids with the Rubik's Cube, they see order. I see chaos. It's the same Rubik's Cube. You can see the half empty, you can see the half full, or you can be a Kabbalist, and what do you see? Both. What's the truth? The absolute objective truth. Is it only half full or only half empty? It's both. Objective truth. Which we look at is what we create. Which we look at is which we create. So today, let's start looking at the whole picture. How many of you have chaos in your life? Oh, now they're all raising their hands. Okay. Right? We all do. But whether you consider it chaos and leave it chaos, or you consider it just disarray that you have to put back in order, half full, half empty is up to you, not me. Up to you, nobody else around you. But let's start seeing it both. Yes, there's an order, but there's a part that's out of order. So let me get in there and put it back in order. Let me put it back in order. And when we decide and we're determined to manifest order, you'd be surprised the miracles that come your way. Things just show up. I'm sure if you start thinking back in your life, when it came, don't they say, necessity is the mother of? Invention, which means 
if you truly feel the desire and the necessity to achieve something, the universe will bring you whatever resources, even if it has yet to be, show up in the physical world. Isn't that an invention? Right? I don't go to my desk and pick up my cell phone and say, wow, I need to make a phone call. I just invented the cell phone. It was already there. But necessity, the mother of invention, means that we can bring out of the potential that's already there what has yet to be manifest. So I'll tell you a quick story. Okay, relatively quick. When I came to the Kabbalah Center, I wasn't known by my Kabbalistic name, Chaim. But I started to use Chaim as my name. So, really to cut the long story short, I decided I wanted Chaim to be my official name. So, this is before 9-11. So, I had a student in LA who said, you just go to the DMV, get a new driver's license, and you can put Chaim, but as long as you put, you know, the name that used to be there in it, so they can kind of track it back, it's okay. So I have a, had a driver's license, Chaim Evan Solomon. Okay, 2001 comes along, you know, all this stuff, you know what happened. 2004, we're moving to, uh, to London, so I have to get a passport. So I go to the passport office, I show my driver's license, that's what they ask for, so they give me a passport, Chaim Evan Solomon. Right, so now I have a driver's license, I have a passport, I go to London, now we come back, we move to Miami when we first moved back to America. So now I have to get a driver's license. So I go to the Florida DMV. Say, so here's, my, here's my old license, here's my passport. Now they look me up because of 9-11 on the social security. I'm not listed, right? There's no Chaim Solomon in the, in the social security. So I say, okay, so now they don't want to give me a driver's license. I say, what do I do? They say, well, either you make your name legal or you go to the social security office and go through all of that to change the, over there. So I said, there's no way I'm going over there because I grew up with bureaucracy, my father was a politician, I'm not going there. So what do I do? I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna go to court, I'm gonna change my name legally. So I spend half the day with the help of one of the students who's a lawyer to go all the way down, whatever it is, an hour away, and I'm looking at it like sort of a waste of my time. I mean, I could be teaching or meeting with students or whatever, so I'm down there, I go to court, I'm in there with the lawyer, the lawyer, you know, okay, what are you here for? The judge is asking, he says, here's the paper, blah, blah, blah. The, the judge looks at the paper and says, okay, but where's form 293 or whatever it is? And the lawyer says to the judge, well, you don't need this, right? You don't have to have it to make it. You telling me what to do? You telling me the judge? You know the judge, okay. He says, but your honor, you don't have to have, I want that form. Well, we didn't have it because you didn't have to have it. So the lawyer looks at me and says, we're not fighting with the judge. You'll have to come back tomorrow. And I'm thinking to myself, another half day. Now it's a half day to go back, and then i got to come back again. I mean, I'm wasting a day on this. So I'm really asking. I'm asking Rabbi Shimon, the author of the Zohar. I said, Rabbi Shimon, you've got to help me. I don't want to waste my time. I mean, just to change my name, maybe it's not worth it. So I walk out of the courthouse, and I'm really begging for help, opening myself. It's not begging out there per se, but I open my consciousness because I know there has to be a better way. So as I'm there, getting ready to walk to my car, who do I suddenly see coming this way? No, the judge is still in his, in his court. But I see a student who I was teaching in the classes in Coral Gables, and she happens to be a judge. So as I'm walking out, she's walking this way. I couldn't have been happier. I don't know what she thought at first. Oh, Christina, like this. I so, so she comes over, you know, and I tell her the whole story. She says, look, come with me. We go up. She, she, because she knew me for about a year now, which was some issue. So she goes, we stand in front of the same judge. And she says, judge, this is me, da-da-da. I vouch for him. I know him, da-da-da-da. Paper signed, that's it. I didn't have to waste the day. But uh, you understand, thing, and I'm sure we've all had things like that. There was a moment when you needed something and someone showed up, something happened, some change, etc., because we opened ourselves. So again, like the human calculator, if you can do it once, how many times can you do it? Infinite, but you have to be open. You have to be open in the same way. You have to have that almost desperate desire for the light to motivate us to do the action. That's the key. And we can't always do that. 
But now they're telling us all over the world that the Kabbalists were considered crazy, far out, loony, whatever, thousands of years ago when they told us mind over matter. But today everybody knows mind over matter. It's simply called in some circles placebo effect. What's a placebo effect? Oh, somebody with a disease and they say, here, we have the magic pill. It's a research pill. It's really what? Sugar. But if you take it, it'll heal your issue. And there's a vast majority of people who will take it, believing that it will cure. And guess what happens? The body cures the ailment. That's not mind over matter. That's not consciousness is everything. We had a guy, unfortunately it's in the opposite way, because it works both ways. We had a guy I met when I first came to the center 32 years ago. He was in one of the wars, unfortunately, that occur often in the Middle East. I think it was the Six Day War, actually. He's out with some friends, they're out on patrol, whatever it was. A bomb came and blew up his friend right in front of his eyes. Now, he looks up in heaven to the sky and he says, and imagine the intensity of the power, the passion, the emotion. He looked up at the sky and he says, if this is what life is, he doesn't want to see any more. From that moment forward, he became blind. Now, was it God blinded him? It was his own creative energy used in a negative way. The sad part of this, for all the years, and he just passed a few years ago, he couldn't build, unfortunately, enough positive energy, positive consciousness, to counteract it. Because it is simple, a balance. If he put 50,000 units of energy into that statement, he needed to build 50,000 units of light to counteract it. But you and I know which is a more powerful emotion for most of us. The anger, the negative, or the positive? The negative. So we put much more energy. So that's why we're here, one, to learn how to prevent, and two, the tools that we can speed it up, which is why every time we have a spiritual Sunday, at the end we meditate with one of the 72 names of God, because we can speed up the process of bringing more and more light. Those of you who are scanning from the Zohar, the power of the Zohar is speeding up the process. It still doesn't do the work for us, but it just empowers us, opens our consciousness, activates the DNA of the Creator in us and other people to speed up the process. Because there's nothing that can't be changed. But we have to put our energy into it. So when you say, yeah, but you know what? Chaim, I've been thinking for years and years and years, I want X, Y, Z to happen. Great! You want it to happen, how much power are you putting behind it? How much belief are you putting it? Or is it like, I really don't believe it, but I would like it to happen. Well then how much power are you putting in? So the universe works not only on our desires or our thoughts, but the energy we put in it. So when you wake up in the morning, most people still holding on to the doubt of yesterday the half-empty part of yesterday, so they wake up in the morning, and what are they creating? Same old, same old. Even though they say, but I want a better day. Yes, but what are you doing about it? Because we've got to overcome all those thoughts in our mind that it's up to the Creator. So what does it say? Every day the Kabbalists encourage us to recite a verse, or at least have it in mind. Betuvo bekol yom tamid ba'aseh bereshit. Every day. The Creator is creating, renewing the universe for good. Sounds very religious, right? God's making the world new every day. So how come it's the same old, same old? Every day is an opportunity for us. There's continuous light, the power of creation being broadcast into this world as we will receive it and make use of it, as we will refresh our own thinking, change the way we look at the universe, and then follow it with action, then things get recreated. If I really, really wanted to, and I must be honest, confess, I did try once. I went on YouTube, I looked at, you know, this system, how to do it, you know, you got to look at the middle dot, and the, this one, and the, that one. I looked at the video, and I said, no, thank you, at least I have kids who can do it, and if I fall into that, I'll... I didn't want to continue, but it's not that it wasn't there. I didn't have the desire, so I didn't follow it with practice, practice. So every day we can 
be one step ahead, realize the universe is giving us a new chance to take out our chaos. It's not like the whole thing is erased and now we can start over, but it's a fresh day and if we will refresh our own thinking and we'll accept more and more that we have the power of creation and perfection is already in us, we just have to make it manifest, then we can change everything. I have a student who just recently told me a story. His whole life, miserable, trouble, every facet of life you could imagine. So what kind of universe was he creating? Chaos, chaos everywhere. Even though he had a decent life and things were good in his life, if you looked up from the outside, you said, oh no, decent life, everything going well, everything looks good. Nice house, nice job, nice this, nice that. But miserable inside, because that was the power that they set in motion, creating daily the same thing. Now comes to Kabbalah. Starts to feel enough misery of their situation to decide to change. Almost like magic. Once we, or once he started to change the way he did and the power behind it, all of a sudden things start to alter. Not only became more powerful to stand up and say what he wanted to say and be more forceful, but he started to notice how people around him started to respond differently. Because he was different, the world was different. And then I just heard recently, even in his job, even his job that was, okay, so-so, not necessarily really um, pleasing, but made an extra effort the last year or so to really put in extra energy, extra effort, etc. And then just recently received an award for the work that he did. Because he was willing to change, the universe around him changed. Now, does that mean everybody in the office is now different? Not necessarily. But at least you and I can attract the better part of people. Because everybody has a good side that they're expressing, and we all have, don't you and I? A little frustration, a little anger, a little short-tempered, etc. So what determines? What situation gets those parts of us? For most, of us, most people, you and I are learning to change it, but most people, if things are going well, what side of them does those situations, those people get? If everybody walked up to you and said, gee, you're so wonderful, so great, so happy, are you going to feel frustrated? No, you're going to be happy. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're boosting my ego. So, yes, I love you too, and you're amazing, and you're great. But you let that one person come into your life, right, that doesn't give you your way or doesn't say the right thing, then what part of you do they get? Then they get the negative side, the frustration, the anger, the fear, the jealousy, whatever it is. So when we can change our world, it's not about they've actually made changes, but we can just be connecting to the good side of them. Hopefully that awakens something in them that they'll also want to change. So on a daily basis, we have the ability of changing our life and the world around us. How many of you ever took a vacation? Ever once? How many of you have a hobby, something you go do now and then to just get a little stress relief? What do we call those things? Recreation, right? I need to go do something for recreation. Go bowling, go this, go take a walk, go hiking, etc. Did you ever stop and think what the word means? Recreate. Oh, we say recreation so we don't get it. To recreate, because why? Every day the universe is renewed for good. It doesn't just say renewed, it's renewed for good. So on a daily basis, we have the opportunity to recreate ourselves. Recreation. But we have to have a pattern. We have to have a goal. So that's why every so often, and maybe we should start doing it more often, what do we remind ourselves about ourselves? Louder. We are pure and perfect beings of light. Because we've got to remind ourselves we already have the perfection. We already have the greatest power of creativity in us. So we need to use that to recreate ourselves more and more towards that pattern. Let it show up, like the Rubik's Cube. I'm sure you figured out by now I can't do it. <laughs> but even if you follow the instructions, it's not a one-shot deal and it goes from chaos to order. 
you got to keep looking at the hints, right? You mess it up, so you look at the center one, and then you look at this corner and that corner, you turn it once. Is it now perfect? No, but it's closer than you turn this way and this way. If you're just watching somebody do it, it doesn't always look even like it's getting closer to perfection. It's still chaos until it gets a little bit more. Maybe they're 80, 90 percent. Now you start to say, oh, 80 percent of the sides are looking pretty good. And then a little bit more and a little bit more. But it doesn't happen instantly. Every day we have a chance to recreate ourselves. Every day we have to stop seeing the illusion that it didn't happen yet and know that it's on the way because the cosmos follows our lead. The cosmos will recreate itself as we create ourselves, piece by piece by piece. So we've already talked about it. We understand this world is our creation. So what have we been able to create and it still exists? Garden of Eden. We created the Garden of Eden, perfection on earth. We unfortunately messed up the Rubik's Cube of the Garden of Eden and it got thrown out. And here we are. But as we will collect ourselves together and as we will decide that we want to recreate Garden of Eden, we want to go back to that perfection, heaven on earth, especially this time, isn't that what everyone's praying for? Heaven on earth, goodwill towards all mankind. Well, hello, wake up. It's not going to happen if we don't do it. Who's mankind? Them? That's what we like to say. Oh, when they'll do, then I'll do. When they'll be nice or I'll be nice. No, we are mankind. It's up to us. We want peace on earth and goodwill towards all mankind. What's our affirmation? Today I commit myself to act with greater love, kindness, and compassion. Because then I've recreated myself more in alignment with that perfect pattern of the pure and perfect light being. And the more we do it, the faster we will create and re-manifest. Garden of Eden, heaven on earth, peace and harmony for everybody. God bless. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now what we do, those of you who are new, um, what we do now is we bless the offering. It is a free will offering. You're welcome to give whatever you'd like to give in acknowledgement of what you've received and in support of the projects of the center. And I just, uh, a couple things before we actually do it. For those of you who know, and we'll do here in a few minutes, we're going to do the meditation on one of the 72 names of God, which is based on the Aramaic letters. So these little books, if you don't have one, I encourage you to get one. And because it is the holiday season, think of it. You're going to go to a holiday party or going to some holiday gathering or whatever it is. Be a conduit of light. Make the world a better place. Get a few of them and give them out, not just randomly, like just to anybody, you know, without thought. Find people that you know have a little more open consciousness. They're a little more spiritually oriented and say, look, I would like to give you this book. I believe it's a book of power, the power of the creator to bring blessings and peace and harmony into your life, even if you just keep it with you. It radiates the light of the creator. And then offer it to them. Yes, yes, no, no. It's okay. If they want it, great. If not, you'll find somebody else. But at least make the effort, right, to ask the universe the help to find people that you can spread this. If you don't have one, it's, it's amazingly important that you keep it with you. Keep it with you. Just keep it around you. Okay, I want to just read you one uh, quick story. I told you about the president of Paraguay, didn't I? A few weeks ago... You know, we have, we have, especially in South America, maybe they just have so much chaos, they're a little more motivated. But they have so much chaos, we have the Zohar Project. So about two weeks ago, some people in, uh, in South America who've been going around all of South America handing out Zohars, they finally got the big sacred Zohar to the president of Paraguay. So we've got amazing, miraculous things going on out there. But I just want to read you this that uh, came, you know, online, we got people all over the world. So he may be even watching. And uh, i just share with you, his name is Mohammed, his last name, initial T. So if he's watching, I hope he's smiling at me. But he writes like this, Good morning from South Africa. I can't wait for your talk. May peace and the good Lord's blessing be, upon, be, with, all, be with us all. Continue with your talks. It's making a difference. So I get this message, I write him back. I said, well, thank you, but how did you find us? So he writes me back. I would like to say divine guidance. I was soul searching, listening to lots of lectures on Sufism. 
and I came across your lectures, Spiritual Sundays with Chaim Solomon. Now I don't miss them at all. Our teachings, he's Muslim, our teachings are so much the same, and thank you for making me a better Muslim and a better human being. I have received your light, now I am passing it on to others. Lots and lots of peace and blessings, and thank you once again. Wow. Yes. Just you understand just the influence that we have on people around the world. And so that's why, you know, the more we're letting people know about the center and the wisdom of Kabbalah and Spiritual Sunday, the faster we can make those changes. Because like this guy, he's Muslim, right? So what does that have to do with the Jews and the Christians and the Buddhists and everybody else? But this is why we mentioned this morning, it's not about the same religion or the same culture, South African. I can't relate to that culture. I didn't grow up in it. I can relate to a human being. I can relate to the soul there, but it's the soul that brings us all in common. And that's what we're reaching out to. And imagine what would happen if every person on earth could at least want to connect to the soul of a person instead of the outside whether they're white, black, yellow, brown, red, whether they're Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, South America, North America, South Africa, North and, uh, what's it, North and South Korea and all that. Who cares? If we reach into the soul of people, think how the world will change. And that's up to us. We are recreating the world on a daily basis. And that's why we always take these extra few minutes to bless the offering because it's going through the center to do more of this. And by your helping to empower it, then you're also receiving equally from what changes there are out there. Like this man, who knows which one of you who may have put, uh, you know, shared the video of one of these spiritual Sundays or just a message that you get from the center, you put it out there, for all you know, it's your message that got to this guy. We have no idea. But don't they say, what is it, six degrees of separation? You put it out there, someone else puts it out there, and suddenly we're all over the world. That's all it takes. That's all we're asking of you. So if you hold your offering in your hand, because we know money is a vessel. It's a container for the energy that you put in it, and that's why we want to put our love and our light and our blessings. So just hold it in your hands, infusing it with the energy of love, of peace, of harmony, goodwill. Just allowing the light of the Creator to radiate out of your soul into this gift, and see this gift going through the center, empowering all the projects, spreading the Zohar everywhere to change people's hearts and their minds, to be more enlightened, enlightened, in alignment with the light of the Creator inside them, with their pure and perfect beingness. That they will naturally, inherently feel to push themselves to express greater love, kindness, and compassion to all human beings, that together we make the world a better place, peace and harmony. As we made it once, we decide today to recreate it that way. So we give thanks for all that the Creator has given us, that we can make it manifest and share it with others, that it brings blessings for others and for ourselves many, many times over. And we open our eyes and we say, Amen. So let's thank and wish all our friends who are watching online a happy week, happy holidays, loud so they can hear you. Yay, thank you for being with us. Happy holidays. Okay.